All right, so uh, I am here with Vic Sohoni. Uh, Vic was born in India, raised in the Philippines, Thailand, Singapore, and the U.S. He's been a journalist working with Reuters. Now he runs Ostinato Records, a Grammy-nominated record label, releasing music from Haiti, Senegal, Cabo Verde, Somalia, Sudan, Djibouti, and more. So I asked Vic on because I've noticed that on Twitter, he has an interesting analysis um, based on living in all these different places on the specifically the systems prescribed for the global South. So um, I think, you know, you were saying, Vic, that it's got something to do with the way you grew up and lots of different uh, systems of government. Can you just do, do you want to just say anything about that before I go on? Yeah, so, so growing up, I mean, of course, being a young kid, you don't really, you're just flung all over the world because your parents' job takes you here and there, and then eventually you live this kind of nomadic life. So you get to experience a lot of different systems. You don't really realize the differences that you're experiencing until you come of age and you study it and you learn, hey, actually, I went through major processes in, in, mm -hmm. in the development process of a region. You know, I saw them from a young age. I saw them through my own families let's say, increase prosperity through the years, which countries we lived in, which countries we moved to. Um, uh, of course, th this was not, this was not uh, your traditional migration. It was more like, my, my dad was not a, my father was not a diplomat, but he, he worked for a company that just bounced him around. And then when he retired, he, he went back to India. So it was very different from a voluntary migration. You know, yeah. uh, it was more just, hey, if you want to keep this job, you got to go <laughs> do it in all these different places. Yeah. So um, one thing I, uh, one thing I, I was looking back on, I, I look back on and say, wow, I actually grew up in a lot of different political systems. I grew up in very robust democracies. I grew up under military dictatorships. I grew up under single party rule. I grew up under uh, single man <laughs> dictatorships. I grew up under many different systems. And when I, when I look at the world today and I think back and travels elsewhere in the global South, particularly the most hard hit areas of the global South, places like Haiti, places like Sudan, where you really, you know, you get a sense of what these countries, I look around and I say, well, you know, through my own experience, the, uh, the democracies I lived in, sure, they had amazing media and press, but they offered the, the lowest standard of living. They were the most societies. They were the most societies. They were the most violent societies. And when I compare them to say growing up um, in a military monarchy kind of system in Thailand, that is what the World Bank calls one of the great development success stories. If you go to the World Bank and type Thailand, the first thing that comes up is Thailand is one of the world's great development success stories. People don't know this. They all think it's some you know, third world backward shithole. It's not, it's, it's, it, I would argue it's one of the most developed countries, not just in the global South, even if you compare it to a lot of Western countries, it has a lot of things, consider it's COVID management, it's healthcare system that a lot of countries don't. Mm -hmm. Being in Singapore, of course, you can have your critiques of Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore, whatever, nevertheless, very wealthy country, extremely high standard of living, amazing opportunities, high salaries, low taxes. And, I, you know, our, our family was faring better. And mm. many and, and much of the people, many of the people were faring better um, when they were not living in. As you look at Asia today, you look at the Philippines, vibrant, vibrant democracy, you know, yeah. some of the most intrepid journalists you can imagine. I mean, the media space in the Philippines, the, the freedom of speech or press or whatever you want to call it, robust as ever. The Philippines is a struggling society. It lags behind most of its neighbors. Indonesia, vast country, their election process is a thousands of islands voting, peaceful transition, a democracy. But, you know, if you ask someone living in Jakarta today, would they prefer to live in Bangkok, Thailand or Singapore? I think they would say they prefer to live in Bangkok, Thailand and Singapore, mm -hmm. countries that are not democracy. So, so, so you and I are going to have like a debate, but it's not a debate because we sort of agree on, <laughs> on the issue. Uh, but I also like I, I, the way you so we're just going to kind of meander around. Yeah, uh, actually, there is an echo. So I don't know, you can probably mute while I'm talking that might or you can yeah throw the headphones back on. Yeah, probably. We do. Sorry. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, we'll meander around a little bit. But I wanted to also say like you you've worked as a journalist. So you also I think you have a certain um, you're like attuned to media freedom and, and things yeah. like that. And also, uh, and you studied history, I guess, uh, like, yeah. I did, yeah, I have a, I have a, I, I, one of the degrees I have is a degree in history, which I still credit to be the most important thing I studied, uh, especially not studying, 
history because because in high school growing up in Southeast Asia, I went to the so-called international schools, which are really just Western schools, right? It's where if you're a foreign kid, you go to the school with all the other kids or the diplomats and the, all these guys. So these schools are just, I mean, if you think education needs decolonizing in the West, you should see how badly education needs decolonizing. You know, I mean, we are taught European and American history through and through and Chinese and Indian and Southeast Asian history is like a semester, even in Asia. It's like a day. You know, so I we have Ch China it's like day. A, you know, and, and, and uh, all, all the teachers come from a very specific part of the world, the settler Anglosphere and the curriculums, uh, the, the most of the student body, because guess what? The global economy is geared for Westerners to succeed. So I was always one of the few Indians from India schools, which always was very enlightening to see. Uh, almost no people from the African continent or black people in general, a lot of Americans at these schools, but no black Americans. Why is that? Um, so these schools were exceptionally Western school. They geared me towards going to the West and that whole path, mm -hmm. right? Um, but history, thankfully, I always questioned it because I realized that why are you only teaching me European history when I can see North Africa and Turkey and all these other places on the map? Mm -hmm. um, but history, history, history taught me just how to recenter things, you know, to, to understand that the Mediterranean is not the center of our world. The Atlantic is not the center of our world. And if we actually study pre-European history, pre-1500s history, which I think is a very important period of history to study, mm -hmm. we begin to understand that the centers of our world are more focused on the Red Sea and the Horn of Africa and the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the, the, this allowed me to realign myself to say, if we can recenter the, how we perceive the world, we can find opportunities in places, right? So mm -hmm. I, I use that for my record. Where in the world would there be great music? Mm -hmm. Well, the Red Sea region is going to have some pretty great music because the world has been transverse, uh, transversing yeah. through there, mingling through there for millennia. And mm -hmm. the music is the greatest evidence we have of that because if you listen to the music, you can hear 15, 16 different cultures in it. You can't mm -hmm. hear 15, 16 different cultures in the music of Rome. That tells you something, what the real centers of our world were, right? right? So, um, and, 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 and releasing that music was what, what earned us a Grammy nomination because people heard the music and said, oh my God, I've never heard anything like this. I said, yeah, because if you went to your center, yeah. You, you can find out where the opportunities are going to be and you can oh. understand where the world is going understood where the world is before Europe, before the 15, 16, 1700s, you will see that a lot of those networks, a lot of those connections, a lot of those trade relationships are coming back. They might be coming back mm -hmm. in different ways, but they are coming back and, and the Chinese are leading that push to build these entire infrastructure, trade network, supply chain systems that largely resemble what came before Europe because Europe dismantled those systems to take mm -hmm. them to the Atlantic so that they exactly. would work for them, right? They yeah. dismantled the Central Asian systems. They dismantled the Indian Ocean systems. So we have to rebuild that to bring the world back to what it was before Europe. And then if you know that, then you can see opportunity everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. You can see opportunity in culture. You can see opportunity in trading. You can see opportunity even if you're working in tech. You can see all kinds of things once you recenter. So I always tell people, I think every journalist, forget any other profession. I found it shocking <laughs> working in working in journalism, Western journalism yeah. with, you know, the most hardcore, like elite Western. Oh, yeah. They don't they don't they never took a history course. How no, could you possibly show up in Somalia or not have a, a clue? Mm -hmm. For, forget about forget about what happened 200 years ago you don't know what happened 40 years ago yeah you have no the, clue so your your insight comes from man these guys are just backwards and i'm going to report on them as such which means you're basically it's, reporting it's you're reporting what people were what european racists were saying 150 years ago without realizing that's what you're doing um okay great so i mean if you yeah yeah, uh, just to just to, so democracy. Okay, we we have we have a lot to we're we're gonna destroy democracy <laughs> today. <laughs> but first of all, like I, I guess we should make this caveat. Um, you know, what do we, what's what what are we talking about? Like when you when you say democracy, because people freak out, right? You were saying people freak people out. just yeah. they just they just can't like it. It's like nails on a chalkboard when you criticize democracy. So what so what are you talking about when you criticize democracy? So yeah, so the first thing for everyone listening to this, I want you to not pearl clutch or freak out when I say. <laughs> When, I, when we criticize democracy, because you know, I, I, I literally received like violent reprisals for just even saying <laughs> democracy is something we should criticize. It's incredible yeah. to me. I just think no. this is ideology at this point. Yeah. This is not yeah. even an, an taboo. So, okay, for, let's just put aside 
the fact that yes, we believe that people should have power and should develop according to what the people want and their needs and all these things. Yes, at the very essence of what a democracy is, that is that people are getting what they deserve and they have, uh, have chosen all these things. Well, what, that's fine. I'm talking about democracy as practiced today, hose on the global south today, the systems of democracy, parliamentary, presidential, federal, whatever, multi-party, this, that, um, and all the all the good stuff that's supposed to be supposed to go with it, accountability and an independent judiciary, just just whatever you conceive of democracy has come about from the last two, three hundred years of yeah. largely North Atlantic and their philosophies of the 17th and 18th, yeah. 18th and 19th exactly. century. Right. So. So we're so, talking so about wanna, yeah. multiple parties, free and fair elections, uh, tr peaceful transfers of power. Uh, privately owned corporate press that can print whatever kinds of criticisms they want of the government. Um, was there anything else that we need to have a democracy in that sense? I guess the parties are also free to make contracts and take money from American, um, you know, from the national, the national, the, the, the cadres are trained in democracy by the National Endowment for Democracy or the International <laughs> Republican Institute. That's an important criterion right uh lobbies yeah. we have lobbies businesses lobby in a in a transparent way they give money to politicians you know openly pure freedom per, so all of those freedoms uh exist and, and corporations i guess are free to help legislators frame the legislation that affects those companies and so yeah on. and, so that, and i think are, that's democracy critique, yeah yeah that's democracy and i think two things to add to that one is that uh Democracy is overwhelmingly being boiled down now to can are people voting? Yes. Okay, that's the first <laughs> yeah. thing. Oh, look, they're voting in this country. They're democracy, fantastic. <laughs> and the second thing we want to talk about, what we're really focusing on, the reason I have such a harsh critique is because I come from a developing part of the world. I work, I've worked my whole life in developing parts of the world. So the only thing I give a damn about is development. I right. hate going to countries and seeing them lag so behind, not even having trash collection systems or sewage systems and electricity grid. That actually makes me very angry. Right. And, and to me, that's why all I care about is development. I work in music because I see it as part of cultural development. You know, and I work with countries and their music because I see it as part of cultural development. So I, I, my critique with democracy is, what is democracy's track record development? Right. And so now this is our one criterion. That, yeah. This is our one criterion. Yeah. It's if we look at is because the society. The, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. No, just like is the society yeah, advancing we, in terms of what people can do and what people get to do is, <laughs> and achieve and have. It, uh, it, it, is it is it prospering? Is it offering people a dignified standard of living? Is it yeah. giving them a $10,000 per capita income a year, which most people will think is low, but it's actually a pretty decent income for most of the world? Mm -hmm. Is it giving you the opportunities to go to good schools and have excellent health care and maybe take a holiday once a mm -hmm. year? Is it giving you all of these things? Mm -hmm. If it isn't, and we're going to talk about this is what the things we're going to break down, then I believe democracy, like any system that's in this planet, is deserving of a critical undressing. How can mm -hmm. we not criticize a system mm -hmm that was invented 200 years ago by a small group of people now imposed and, and considered universal, imposed all over the world, practiced by billions, track results are not. Yeah. <laughs> so. so I want to just I want to just dispose then before we move on of this kind of historical argument, because you have Plato, the Republic. Plato has a critique of democracy. He says the trouble with democracy is if you give the people power, they're going to take all the rich people's stuff. I mean, he says it pretty explicitly. And he says, that's why we have to have oligarchy. That's why we have to have, you know, that's why we have to create the system where we fool these people into thinking they're better and this whole hierarchy. So back then, yep. they thought of democracy as a bad thing. And that was the case for, uh, you know, 1700 years or so, like right until the 16, 1700s, when they, they would study Oriental despotism and, and, prescribe it like now today it's like a bad word but back in the in the 1600s when french and jesuits and and prussians were talking about oriental despotism they they thought it was a good thing you know uh you you promote people through competitive exams you have a centralized bureaucracy you have centralized revenue connection collection and you can do things for for you know as a state they thought that was good and they established some of these absolute monarchies almost on that model so the opposition to that is British, 
who have like, no, we want the nobles to have power. We want the nobles to be able to uh, assert their will over the monarch, over the king. Um, we want to control the slave trade, for example, which was the, you know, Gerald Horn historian writes about that being the real reason for the glorious revolution in England and a big part of the 1776 revolution in the US. Um, and then, so now when we get back to democracy in the 19th century, what people are talking about is what, like I'd say, Domenico Lacerdo calls like, and he quoting somebody else, but like, hair invoke democracy, democracy for white people, democracy for the chosen people, right? And so like, was the US a democracy before the 60s when black people literally couldn't vote? Was, is Israel a democracy now if Palestinians uh, have a series of rights that they don't have inside if they're if they have Israeli citizenship let alone the occupied people in Palestine um, in West Bank and Gaza so like when democracy you know the way that the ancients defined it has only ever happened two or three times in history right like the Paris Commune mm -hmm maybe a Swiss canton or two, uh, ancient Athens. Um, the rest of what we have that's called democracy is this thing, which we're going to call democracy from now on in this debate, just so we're clear. Uh, we're not talking about yeah. the people directly controlling their fate because we don't really see that anywhere in the world, almost. What we see is a system, like we said, multiple parties, elections, independent press, non-governmental organizations. So I just want to make sure people say, because I know the comments in advance, they're going to say, that's not democracy, though. That democracy is, uh, you know, when the people rule. And it's like, yeah, I, I suppose. Yeah. But that's not what anybody says when they criticize a country for being non-democratic. They're not saying the people don't rule because the people yes, don't Yes, and, and I, there's two things that, to add to what you just said. The first is, we are talking about a system that was invented by slave owners and colonizers yeah. in England and North America. This system was never built to be for anyone but their own elite ruling class. Look at the recent, Liz Truss just got put in as PM in the UK. Do you think anyone outside her little chumocracy elite class ever gets becomes the prime minister of the UK? It was always meant for a tiny elite. In every, every one of these societies, it was always for a tiny elite to take power. Now you're telling us that a system by slave owners and colonizers in the North Atlantic, based on their context, their situation, their power interests, that's meant for everybody. And they invented this system to, to be an investment vehicle for the most powerful interests of their day. They made democracy what it is. It is a marketplace. So for the United States, the United States was a democracy for the mining and timber companies who used the state to clear out indigenous land so they could mine, they could mine the, the land, they could steal the timber and do all these other things. And the then British, get and then get slaves to grow cotton on the on those newly. And then get slaves lands. to grow cotton yeah. on them. The Br British democracy was just the political arm of all of their corporations that went on to the world and plundered the world. Um, yeah, I mean, know, and, and, and someone so if, someone if, if, attacked if, you for saying that too, and it's like, uh, you know, that the 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 company that has shares and the shareholders vote, that is the mental model for Anglo democracy. So when you said, you know, the East India Company is the model, that people didn't understand that, but that like you're actually closer yeah. to what these people think of when they think of <laughs> democracy yes. uh, than like, you know, yes. mob rule, you know, as Plato feared would would come up. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and so it's a system for the elites. And if we look at the Western world. OK, so we know the Western world did not develop by being a democracy. In fact, no country developed, industrialized, built middle classes, built good healthcare, none of this, not a single Western country. Spain had a fascist government until 1975. The Portuguese had a fascist government until 1975. Some of these guys didn't give up their colonies until 1991. And I don't care if you're in France and you've got a democracy in the 1800s or whatever, if you're the Vietnamese and the Haitians are not voting for their French overlords, the British, the British were a democracy. They had a billion people around the world, more than that, who are not voting for their British overlords. The United States, what a joke. Let's be real. Never a democracy. Even today struggles to even 
consider itself democratic on, on multiple levels. So none of these countries developed actually industrialized, built dignified standards of living, all the good stuff that we want in the global south that some countries in the global south have achieved because that system was never geared towards development. It never was and it has never been prerequisite for development and it certainly has never been a necessity for development. And, and, and if it's only for an elite class of people, yes, then it serves that class fantastically well. Across the global South, the most democratic countries are the most unequal societies. The democracy works fantastic for that top layer of people in Mexico and Brazil and in Kenya and India and Indonesia. It works just as it should. So this system that was invented in England and the United States and this process that played out of being an investment vehicle for the most in powerful interests of the day, for being for an elite class is now playing out across fragile, developing post-colonial societies and we wonder but, why can't yeah. why can't they develop well yeah <laughs> let me let me make another note because there's another yeah. thing that people say i'm just like yeah. i'm just going through yeah. all the criticisms because another one they say is like well vic you know uh you're criticizing democracy well what else is there but authoritarianism like are you talking about disappearing people in the streets and you know throwing people in jails and you know committing genocide and it's like Every one of those things happens under under every democracy that you're talking about here. Like Colombia, like Colombia has been a perfect democracy, like elections, robust, you know, power sharing, multi all of these things. And like Colum democratic Colombia is where the army disappeared thousands, maybe tens of thousands of peasants just like catches them on their way to work, shoots them in the head puts a gun in their hand and says, this was a gorilla. And they did that thousands of thousands upon thousands of times in like recent years, like in the 2000s, like it's called the false positive scandal. Look that up, yeah. people. Perfect, demo perfect democracy. The US, I mean, you know, people talk about US black sites and, and Guantanamo. There's a black site in Chicago uh, where the police injure people and torture people and disappear people. Um, that this is domestic policy, right? I mean, the Assange yeah. case, the Snowden case, where's the freedom oh. of press? They're trying to try Assange, extradite him. One democracy, the UK, has decided that Assange is going to be uh, extradited to the US, another democracy, for treason against the US, despite the fact that Assange is not even American. He's from Australia. Australia. A third democracy who has no interest in defending his great democratic rights or freedoms they're like whatever do whatever you want to him we don't care so i find it yeah i find it very troubling that we lack such a political imagination that if someone says i have a high skepticism of the Dem western democratic system and model they think oh my god I'm written for authoritarianism you're a, a an advocate for despotism i said god can you get rid of these buzzwords <laughs> for just one second? But like, what are the practices of, right? What are the practices of authoritarianism? What are the practices? What is it that you don't like about authoritarianism? And show me a democracy that doesn't do all of these nasty things. Because they do them. Yeah, and, and also, they they all, I mean, listen, there are state abuses on every yeah. country in this world. I mean, yeah. maybe you can find some small European country like Liechtenstein, which is a perfect democracy and has nothing. Well, sure, Liechtenstein is the size of my zip code in Bangkok. I could build yeah. an amazing democracy with my zip code in Bangkok. Right. Okay, but right. our countries in the global south are massive. They right. are massive. Okay, and we cannot, we cannot constantly just sit. In, we're at a stage now when the Western narrative about everything is faltering at every step. So yeah. it is a time to look and really critically assess and say, what has this done for countries? Okay, now thinking about Colombia, let's let's just do a clean sweep, global south. Okay, we'll go all the <laughs> okay. way on from a flat map right. from let's the west it. to the east. Okay, yeah. let's look at the most robust, the most robust democracies in the global south. I'll, I'll go through a few. Mexico, a okay. lot of elections, intrepid journalists. You know, I'm not a safe place for journalists, but that tells no, you those journalists well, are intrepid it's... and they're finding out things. Yeah, I mean, the yeah. thing about yeah. this yeah. bus. It's, 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 it's like... a, Mexico's the democracy where a bus full of teachers, uh, at te uh, teachers college students can just disappear into Appears. thin air, and all the students disappears into thin air. Yeah, get slaughtered. So, so, that's, you, um... so you have you have Mexico, 
Uh, Jamaica, if anyone follows Jamaican elections, they are crazy. They are some of the most hotly contested elections there are. I, I love following the Jamaican elections. These crazy stories about what's happening. Robust democracy, Jamaica, you know, fought it hard, took it from the British and built their own democracy. Brazil, my goodness. Okay, they had military rule for a little while, but robust democracy. I mean, a mm -hmm. very diverse society, you know, uh, I mean, a really, really robust democracy. Independent um, judiciary. Let's go to Africa. The, the judiciary in Brazil in, is so independent that they threw some of the yes. most prominent political candidates in jail. <laughs> yeah. Independent judiciary in Brazil, right. <laughs> let's go to Africa, Kenya. I mean, they just had an election and I see people tweeting all kinds of the election, but a robust democracy, not always peaceful transitions of power, but a robust democracy nonetheless. And you see the kind of lit literary minds, journalistic minds, creative minds coming out of Kenya. There is a lot of what the West would call freedom of thought in that society. Mm -hmm. South Africa, my God, these people fought tooth and nail, tooth and nail to, to earn that democracy. You know, the uh, considered a model of what, uh, ex-colony and a paid could build if they threw out their their oppressors then let's go to asia india the world's biggest democracy we celebrate all democracy. the time yeah world world okay then let's go to pakistan. indonesia pakistan is, a, democracy. pakistan is a pakistan. democracy they, pakistan is they use democratic is, they, procedure they, they, they to have, get rid of the most popular prime minister uh you know they used a purely democratic method to to get rid of him right i mean it's yeah they're right and then you go to Indonesia. I mean, 250, 300 million people, giant country. They elect their leader mm -hmm. over thousands of islands. The electoral process is incredible. You have to go to these vast, you know, <laughs> in the boonies islands to, and you can see the electoral process go down. Philippines, where I grew up. I remember living in the Philippines. I lived through, I mean, there were so many elections. I was, I yeah. was always a new leader in power. Now, all of these countries still developing at a snail's pace are all deeply unequal societies mm -hmm. are they all ex daily dysfunction in public and private constantly there's daily dysfunction all of them and most importantly they are all violent societies mexico violent. brazil Extreme. jamaica south africa kenya india indonesia philippines i remember living in the philippines that was not a safe place when i lived there in the 90s it was not a safe place people it, you know it has a lot of similarities with latin america because it had the same colonizers so you have yeah. a lot of the same kidnapping gangs mafiosis i mean it's it's not dissimilar you know so i remember a very violent place so now are all these countries doing something wrong from mexico to the philippines and everything in between are we all just so backwards we can't get this right or is there something about the democratic system that encourages everything I just said? Mm -hmm. Is there something about the democratic system that yields inequality, that galvanizes violence? And if you read, you know, the problem is read scholars from the global south. They read people from the Western Europe, not even Western Europe. They read people from England and like Northeast United States. And they think that's the, the ultimate catalog about, of knowledge. Yeah, if you read, write about the global south. Yeah. Write about, yeah, right. And if you, uh, one scholar, Orlando Patterson, I rec recommend every go read him. Mm. Uh, everyone go to the most foremost critic, cri uh, cr formicizers of democracy, foremost mm. analysts of democracy. And he has a very interesting theory. He actually has a whole YouTube talk about this. You can go look it up. Okay. He says democracy is one of the greatest causes of violence. Mm -hmm. Because again, he looks at, he, he did the same thing I did, this little exercise. He looked around the world. Mm -hmm. He looked at democracies in the developing world. And he said, they are all bound by one truth. I, mm -hmm. I put an in inequality, daily dysfunction, and I think a lot more things that they are bound by. But mm -hmm. to him, they are bound by violence. And mm -hmm. he says, because you have these fragile post-colonial societies, mm -hmm. many of them are newly constructed communities with groups of mm -hmm. people who have no long shared history of being a community. Now they have to mm -hmm. run this country. Mm -hmm. They are almost in some kind of anarchy, yeah. right? Where, and so in, in this kind of anarchy, when they are forced to vote, their political parties become their, the, you know, their nearest uh, reach out for security. So it, it plays along, you know, yeah. along clan, ethnic, race, yeah. class, whatever lines you want, but it divides society greatly. Yeah. This becomes my camp. That becomes my camp. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you see this in Jamaica. Jamaica, mm -hmm. when there are elections, I don't know if this happens anymore, but J Orlando Patterson talks about this as well. And this is something that got me very intrigued with Jamaican elections. When Jamaican elections are, when the, when the campaign process is taking place, there's a great deal of violence because political parties mm -hmm. hire local mobsters, gangsters, whatever, mm -hmm. to go intimidate. They have gang shootouts because they go intimidate yeah. people who are in neighborhoods that might be voting for the opposition candidate. What the hell yeah. kind of system is this? You are literally yeah. provoking violence. Yeah. 
Yeah. You are literally provoking violence. Look at look at some of the federal well, in, India. India is yeah. India is like a science. They have riots. You know, they they organize communal <laughs> riots, anti-Muslim riots, where they want to, you know, have an electoral outcome go for the for this part for their party. It's 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 scientific. 100%. Like they're looking at a map and they're saying, let's send these guys over here to have a riot. <laughs> let's send them over here too. Here is good. We're winning here. We don't need a riot there. So you're right. It's a it's a system of organized uh violence. Um and I think it's you a mentioned system of organized violence. Yeah. I think you mentioned also like the breakup of like okay, well, Guyana. I also want to mention Guyana because there it's like mm-hmm. racial. Like there's a there's an Indian political yes. party and there's a black political party and they're they they run in elections and like everybody votes their skit color and that's not a good that's not a good democracy like democracy is not helping there it's not it's not soothing the tensions of it's not of no, the not of, at all uh, you know that exist um, and then you know the extreme cases is like uh, USSR Yugoslavia these big multi ethnic states that then broke up into ethnic states that hate each other and, uh, you know, and hate Russia. I mean, overall, their main their main goal seems to be to hate Russia and continue to break up Russia into more parts and Yugoslavia to break up Serbia into more parts. Yeah. So, so, like, it's, uh, you know, and democracy is a huge weapon for this. Like, it's a huge, the violence of democracy is an important weapon for breaking up uh, countries. It is totally, I mean, people have to remember the Yugoslav wars, the balkanization that happened in that part of the world happened in what, the 1990s. It was preceded by what? Yugoslavia adopting multi-party electoral democracy and under everyone extreme ended up voting. US duress under extreme under duress. extreme US yeah. duress yeah it broke up the country it broke up the country you yeah. see it happening now in Somalia Somalia today has a democracy but mm-hmm. guess what that democracy is playing out along clan lines yeah. you see this happen again and again and across these countries you see it happen in uh, in Ethiopia, my goodness, federal democracy. Ethiopia was a model state for Africa not mm-hmm. too long ago. Mm-hmm. It is now breaking up along ethnic line. And this is a federal democracy where power was devolved, where mag centers were built to make sure that they were not concentrated in the capital so that not only yeah. the center got all the wealth. This The development program of Ethiopia followed a great deal of East Asia. And, and, and yet it's still, still yeah. engendered an ethnic warfare that's happening today in Ethiopia. Well, so, you know, <laughs> there, all there's of, another yeah. dynamic which the West will, you know, like the US invades Iraq, right? Sad- Saddam Hussein, uh, authoritarian dictator. Um, look, I'm not going to say it. Go look at the developmental outcomes for yourself under Saddam Hussein. Just look, look, look at them. I'm not going to say okay. anything. There's torture, there's torture, there's people in pre- people trying to overthrow Saddam Hussein had a horrible, they died horribly, like it was a horrible thing. Uh, free his sons were terrible, we know his, we, we know he ran with an iron fist, but yes, yeah. go look at the development Just go outcomes. look at it. Um, uh, Yugoslavia, run by a strong man, Tito, uh, you know, uh, Soviet Union, Stalin, you know, all of these uh, places, and then, uh, but, but sorry, let, let me get back to Iraq. Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya. These were all run by, you know, authoritarian, in Afghanistan's case, communist dictators, but, you know, Dawood before that. Anyway, dictators, strongmen. Then the U.S. goes and invades them, occupies them. And what do they impose? They impose democracy. (laughs) Multi-party democracy. If this is such a good system, why does the U.S. impose it on people that it conquers? Uh, if it w- if it was good for maintaining it, de- why do they why do they go and invade against strongmen and replace it with democracy in Canada? Just two more cases because in Canada, mm-hmm. Canada imposes democracy on indigenous nations on First Nations, so they impose uh, elections and to, for, on the chiefs of the of the First Nations. So the the First Nations aren't allowed to have their traditional uh, leadership system, which actually is you know in the real sense of the word democratic in a lot of ways they have you know the women have a specific role in choosing leaders and there's a whole system the different systems that they have um that are ways of ensuring that 
everybody gets a say and the, the good decisions are arrived at and people know about them and people think about them. But that's all replaced with democracy. And Canada imposes such frequent elections on these First Nations that they can't get anything done, right? Because it's like, it's not an election every, you know, in Canada, the, the prime minister can call an election whenever. So, you know, he can call it in five yeah. years, three years, four years, five years. But in native nations can't do that. Native nations, the chief has to be elected. I think it's like every two years or something. So they yeah. can absolutely not, it's clearly punitive. It's like, you're going to have an election every two years. And that's because we can't make you have an election every three months. Because if we see could, this? we would make you have an election every three months so you could not get anything see, done. Yeah. yeah. So the first thing I want to point out is because we're talking about dictators and strong men and the horrible things yeah. they do. I want people, I know the Western imagination is so overly moralized that you can't even have a conversation with it yeah. without morality just seeping out from every crevice. <laughs> so I want just, I, I want people to put aside the morality because I'll tell you what, where I come from, morality is not as important as development. Okay. Like right. I, let's look at this soberly. Yeah, people yeah. do bad stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Like bad. And there are evil people. I have no time for this discourse with, you know, with people who want to throw that in my face. I am yeah. always asking the same question. Right. Are your students graduating from good schools? Do, yeah. Can do you have immunization clinics deep in the rural areas? Mm -hmm. Is your income decent? Do you have roads? Do you calories. have a telecommunication How many system? calories do people eat? Calories. Again? How <laughs> many calories? That's the, that's, that's what people will listen to this and say, oh my God, they're defending Saddam. Stop it. Just please, please grow up. <laughs> the, sec the second thing is, you see, um, the West knows what this system is all about. They invented it. Yeah. They know it is antithetical to development. They yeah. know it is an investment vehicle for powerful interests. The reason they wishes this on countries is not because they wish to see these countries develop, because it knows it is the easiest system for them and their interests to interfere in. Yes, we exactly. know that Western exactly. powers, Western companies get involved in elections all yeah. over the world, because when you have an open society like this, a fragile open society, they can just come in, an NGO can finance this candidate Spread and buy off around. this group. And, 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 and you have everything you need to, to, to destabilize or to control a country. And yes, going back to Iraq, I mean, I remember tweeting about this. I thought this was, every time mm -hmm. I read about Iraqi democracy, all I see is impasse, yeah. come to consensus, complete dysfunction, complete yeah. corruption. And people might say, yeah, they're not doing it right. No, 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 no. It's functioning they're just it right. as it should. Yeah. Why? If you are, you think they're trying to build up a strong, stable, prosperous Iraq again? No, they've imposed that system because they know it's going to leave them for the next two generations yeah. unable to build a sewage system that yeah. existed under Saddam. Electricity so, yeah. under Saddam. And, so, and that's the thing, right? Saddam was authoritarian. Uh, and, you know, I, I've read a lot about, I read a lot about Iraq. I don't talk about it now. Um, you know, but like yeah. I was an anti-war activist in those years and I know a lot about Iraq now. I've read scholarly yeah. literature, you know, I'm like, but it's, you know, and people say like, you know, because Saddam was Sunni, he suppressed the Shia. And of course he did suppress uh, Shia political leaders because, you know, he repressed any rival political leaders. Uh, that's what authoritarians do. Um, but the whole like the fragmentation of like Sunni Shia Kurd that's a post you know that level of devastating fragmentation is post deliberate US, post U.S. occupation deliberate and and policy yeah totally. and exacerbated by the demo you know whatever you want to call this the democratic system and by the way like Germany like the Nazis people also talk about like democracy enabled <laughs> the Nazis to rise to power which is not false and especially because again if you look when, when you read the if anybody's reading the history of uh, interwar like post-world war one Germany and the rise to power of the Nazis What's striking about it is you're like, and then they had an election that the SPD won, and then they had an election that the Nazis uh, did better in, and then they had the, an election that the SPD uh, won again, so they felt secure, and then they were worried about the communists, and then they had a, and you're like, we're talking about like 10 years or something? Why are there so many elections? What the hell is going on here? And again, they imposed this system on Germany, which lost the war, 
And the frequency of elections was a big part of like the Nazis were like, okay, we didn't get it right this time. That's okay. We'll have another election in a couple of years and we'll get it right next time. So they can just keep, you know, the, the authoritarians, if you're worried about them, can keep trying <laughs> in a democracy until they get it right. And then they can get rid of that system, um, which is what Westerners do whenever they get an authoritarian they like, whether it's Suharto or... Um, you know, the Duvaliers or Mobutu or whatever. They have a democracy for as long as it's uh, it's their, their stooges. And then when they get a good stooge that they like, they'll just, they'll just suspend democracy for the next 30 years or whatever. And that's fine, right? So this, this is the, th this th the thing. I find elections are the greatest detriment to a stable yeah. course of building a developed society. And I know people see the problem is people in the West have no idea what development is. They just, because they are, they did yeah. not exist when their societies were industrialized right. and developing. We exist while that stuff is happening right now. So right. we see what development is. Yeah. And we know that, like I mentioned, none of the Western countries were democracies when they developed. Uh, according to Joel, Brit the British empire and by extension, all empires were according to him, quote, a despotism with theft as its final ob object. They were mm. kleptocratic despots. That's how they developed. OK, mm. so they didn't develop by demo democracy. So put that aside, because if mm. they had done, they would have had no straight course of development. I'm not mm. defending how they developed. I'm just telling you how they did it. Yeah. Now, if we look at elections, let's take the let's take the example of Brazil. You know, Brazil is a country uh, like how you, you read a lot about Iraq. I was so infatuated with Brazilian culture mm. for so long. I started getting deep into Brazilian politics. And I grew up in Singapore, which has one of the biggest Brazilian communities outside of Brazil because they have a lot of companies doing uh, business there. And I learned a lot about Brazil and particularly the racial dynamics of Brazil from that. And, you know, I, I realized when, when, when Lula came to power, I, I, I remember following what he was doing with Brazil during that whole pink tide revolution in, mm -hmm. in, in, in South America. There were two things that he did that I found I hope everyone can agree these two things are very important to development. One of the first things he did was increase Black Brazilian participation in higher education. Mm -hmm. Okay, he expanded that. He had programs to expand that. We can all agree that's a good thing. Yes, <laughs> there are a lot of Black Brazilians. Be... <laughs> like us agree. <laughs> Democrats yeah. agree. Yeah. Right. The second thing he had was, I don't remember the Portuguese word for it, but it was called a Z program because Bolsa Brazil. Familia. Bolsa Familia. Yeah. Was that... I Wait. believe that might have been it. Wait, what was the word? I, it I was... missed it. It, zero hunger. So whatever yeah, zero forme, hunger was. Forme zero, forme, forme zero. Yes, forme was. zero. Yes, yes. And and he managed to bring down hunger greatly. Now, yeah. elections happened. They threw his ass in jail. They elected yeah. Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro reversed both the black participation. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Black participation in Brazilian universities has, has plummeted. Hunger has risen. And, yeah. and we are supposed to believe that this is a victory for democracy and Brazil. Yeah. Are you yeah. kidding me? Yeah, yeah How exactly. Can you, like, so democracy also <laughs> means democracy also means any gain you make developmentally can be reversed uh, within a few years, uh, the minute and there's it always, another election. And it always does, right? Because yeah. what are political candidates selling? Very few political candidates in the global south are selling development. They are selling yeah. very different things. They are selling identity. They are selling uh, strife. They're selling religious differences. They're selling everything that gets them elected because it's a marketplace. Mm -hmm. And you have to brand and market your product, which is you, for everybody. The same thing happens in the United States. The, the American presidents, Obama was the greatest marketer, brand face of the yeah. earth. He's not selling you anything but a pack of lies and a fantasy. <laughs> and that's what democracy <laughs> often sends you. And that is also right. the job of politicians, whether, and it's, and that doesn't stop when you're elected. So if you look at like the stable, the most stable democratic society, which is, I guess, the US, although I guess we'll see, um, you know, the next few elections in the US are going to be challenging, um, to say the least. But, but um, you know, you have a two party system in the US to suck all oppositional energy uh, and prevent any challenge to the economic system, the inequalities, et cetera. And in that sense, again, like I've read, and I thought this was kind of convincing, like two parties is actually worse than one party would be in the US. And why do I say that? Because people were saying you, the US has primaries, right? The US has primaries. The parties have no functional difference in terms of their relationship to corporations, their wealth, lack of welfare interests, their locking up of people, their worship of police power, their 
invasion and occupation of other countries, their attempts to start World War III. All of these things are the same, but like um, they each have primaries. And if you had one party, you would get genuinely different candidates in the primaries. Mm-hmm. And then when they were all in power, you would have some, they would have to negotiate something um, among them and they would be genuinely empowered. But because you have two parties, you you know that everyone in the Republican Party is going to do the Republican thing and the everyone in the Democratic Party is going to do this. To, and these superficial differences are what are marketed. It's like, you know, the the bombing, you know, you've seen that meme where the plane that's bombing is yeah, yeah, black yeah, yeah. and there's it's a rainbow yeah. coalition bomber. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the, the last thing is like between the lobbying and the fundraising, right? So like, if you look at the actual job of a Western politician, when they're in office, they're still spending most of their time on the phone begging rich people for money. And like yeah, that, that kind of supplicant position that democratic politicians are in all the time. And this is every democracy around the world. Every democracy. Every democracy, yeah. Yeah. So uh, on that point, I wanted to bring up another point of Orlando Patterson's that I love, which is so true when I thought about it, and I thought about it, and it's he's got he's nailed it. Organized crime loves mm-hmm. democracies. Organized crime thrives in democracies for the same reason you're talking about. Again, let's do a little sweep of the world. Let's mm-hmm. look at Japan. Japan, mm-hmm. vibrant democracy, model democracy. Oh my God, everyone loves Japan. Everyone loves imposed, Japanese democracy. Imposed on them because they lost World War II. <laughs> right. right. The Yakuza in Japan, we all know the Yakuza, right? Or Japanese organized crime syndicate. Mm-hmm. The Yakuza has played a powerful role in Japan. It's diminished lately, but it's played a powerful role in Japanese politics because it's one of the most powerful lobbying groups. The Yakuza has people on the inside of Japanese politics, which is why they're still functioning. The Mexican drug cartels. Okay, you you spoke about Colombia. Let, let's talk about Colombia. Everyone's seen Narcos, so this will touch a nerve. Okay, <laughs> if you've watched all, you've watched all the seasons of Narcos. The one thing I was watching and watching and looking and saying, what the hell? Pablo Escobar was thrived in a democratic society. Democratic society. He, he was, they were having, in during the show, they showed you the elections that were taking place and one candidate was for extradition, one candidate wasn't. This man was buying favors, buying off judges, buying off influence, elected. You were electing a narco terrorist who was blowing up planes and kids mm-hmm. into office. This was Colombian democracy where a drug dealer was thriving, absolutely thriving, because he could purchase influence because he was one of the most powerful interests of the day. The Yakuza were one of the most powerful interests of the day, and they love democracy. They absolutely Mm -hmm. love democracy. Organized crime thrives in democracies. You think about the United States as a democracy coming up, a nation of gangs, a nation of organized crime, a nation of the mafia. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You think Mm -hmm. about any democracy today, Mexico, drug cartels, crime syndicates. You think about Nigeria, crime syndicates. And I hate to put this negative spin on these countries because I hate doing that, but I'm just pointing out that these crime syndicates tend to thrive in democratic societies. And you got to ask yourself why. And if crime syndicates are thriving in democratic societies, if they have the wealth and influence, which as crime syndicates do, to buy influence as they can in these marketplaces of democracy, How is that conducive to development in any way whatsoever? How is it conducive to development to have Pablo Escobar free and roaming, (laughs) bombing your streets in Colombia? You know, and everyone's seen the show. I don't know how anyone watched that show and didn't make the connection that one of the world's worst narco terrorists was existing in a very vibrant, free and fair election democracy. That, aff- that had, and you know, this is one of those, old, this is one of those new world societies. So it has all the good stuff of these constitutions and rights and yeah. Thing. Yeah. And I mean, Colombian history is, Colombian history is amazing, including recent history. Like there's a, there's another scandal called Parapolitica. So this is, a, this is, mm-hmm. a, this is one for you, Vic. You're going to love this because um, there were uh, paramilitaries. So basically, you know, to fight the guerrillas, to fight the communist guerrillas, uh, Colombia, the Colombian state and the U.S. organized basically death squads to go and kill anybody, the social base of uh, the guerrillas. So they kill native leaders, they kill black leaders, they kill women leaders, they kill unionists, uh, they do social cleansing, they kill homeless people. And that, that's that been going on, still happens, still exists. 
uh, the the peace accords didn't change the paramilitarism in Colombia at all. And and at one point, um, some of these paramilitaries were caught, um, and they were upset uh, at being kind of you know they were upset because they were you know like uh, you know Jack Nicholson and a few good men. He's like, I'm just doing the job you sent yeah. me to do. Yeah. Why are you getting mad at me? So one of them was like, Listen, I have signed p- pacts with politicians uh with like half or 30 percent of the politicians in the congress right now uh with paramilitary organizations to you know contracts like you're gonna kill my political rivals and kill these unionists and whatever and and so they had uh basically admitted i mean confessed or admitted or bragged the paramilitary organization controlled a good portion of the politicians in the country. And, you know, ha- <laughs> democracy, right? Like, <laughs> democracy. So, um, and and then Colombia's neighbor, Venezuela, who's, you know, doing a lot, I, I you know, I'd argue, of course, lots of people disagree, but I'd argue they're doing a lot to try to develop the country. And against them is a lot of sanctions and a lot of uh, terrorism and sabotage. Um, and the big one of the big problems they have is their democratic system gives the basically pro US anti development faction very frequent opportunities to uh to try to to try to oust them right they're they're they've been trying to oust them for 20 years and because they don't think they can win electorally, they just decided, well, according to this constitutional rule, I'm the real president and the U.S. backs me. And so there's this supposed, con- they can also manufacture a constitutional dispute out of nowhere um, because, you know, in part, at least because of the democracy. Now, you know, Venezuela's complicated because they're trying to change, you know, they've changed the constitution and stuff, but nonetheless, the democratic nature of the constitution is part of what gives the U.S. so many opportunities to overthrow them, as opposed to say Cuba, which you know, is, which doesn't. They allow don't like that. closed societies. They yeah. don't like closed political societies because they can't interfere in it. it. Has nothing to do with morality. It has nothing to do with democracy. We should already know this. This is child's play. I mean, this is literally one one right now. They yeah. they they hate closed systems because they can't overthrow them. But if we're yeah. talking about development, we've given you a track record now. Anyone who's yeah. listening, we've given you a track record of, of the major democracies. Forget the West. Again, the West developed by being a despotic, kleptocratic colonizing yeah. society okay so they were so you even when they had democracy that. at home you can't nobody repeat can repeat that. if we that. did no we, we'd have to have settler colonies to send people yeah. off to we would have to have multiple colonies that that flood us with resources we can't do that so yeah. now if we look at the track record on the world outside of the west the only region in the world that has achieved anything remotely close to Western standards of living, Western incomes, amazing healthcare, so good cities, good quality of life, all that have been countries in East Asia. You compare mm-hmm. it to anywhere in the world, okay, compare it to the, the, the states and their resources, I think they're just an anomaly because of their resources, so it doesn't even matter. But then again, also didn't develop because they're democracies. But yeah. East Asia, yeah. East Asia offers an amazing development model I'm about this in other talks, and I tweet about it a lot. But mm-hmm. if we look at the East Asian model, the countries in East Asia that developed, even the Japans, the South Koreas, the Taiwans, uh, the Singapores, and then, okay, those are the high entities. Now, if we take it down a notch at the upper middle incomes, the Malaysias, the Thailands that I grew up mm-hmm. in, even the Vietnam today, which has just increased its income ninefold in the last decade. Imagine if your incomes were nine, would you take a deal where in 10 years your income is nine times higher? Yes, you would. It's, it's an incredible, incredible feat. Something from dollars per capita now to 9,000, 10,000 with purchasing power a little bit higher. They're, they're reaching upper middle income status very, very rapidly. Now, if we look at that history, none of them developed by being democracies either. Even if some of them are today, South Korea laid its industrialization base, a base for all the good stuff that it has today under military rule in the 70s and 80s. Japan industrialized, not when it was a democracy, it was anything but industrializing in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, Taiwan, single party, iron fisted rule that laid the foundation for everything that it is today. Um, Singapore, one party rule, they have the pretense of democracy, but what they do is they keep the opposition artificially weak and Lee Kuan Yew will always say, because guess what? If I get elected out of power, you might lose all of this. 
you know, and whether you believe that or not, that's what he believed. Of course, people in Singapore, I know friends in Singapore be listening to me right now, like Vic, I, I can't believe you. No, <laughs> I'm just giving you, he, he, a single party laid the foundation for democracy. Thailand, the country I love the most in the world, what I consider home, I have read, you can trust me about my knowledge of history of this place. Yes, it's mm -hmm. had a lot of dysfunction, but at the, at the end of the day, what Thailand really did was it created a democracy just to keep the West happy. The Thailand is like a bit of a Switzerland. <laughs> they just like keeping people happy. So remember, right. they were Thailand never colonized, yeah. never invaded. They've never had anyone, yeah. right? So they like to keep people happy. So they said, you know what, the democracy just build a parliament and do something, but the power structures never change. Now in the 1950s, mm -hmm. they, set up a, they set up a national development council, which laid the foundation for much of what Thailand is today. And that National Development Council was run by a brigadier general. It was the monarchy working together for many years that laid the foundation for Thailand's healthcare, which is ranked six best in the world by John Hopkins. You saw its COVID outcomes, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Healthcare deep into the rural areas. You can go to the border with Burma, with Vietnam, deep rural areas where people live uh, who are obviously much uh, less well off than people in the cities. They can still get their surgeries. They can still go to the dentist and it's all free. Okay, and maybe it's a small fee. Okay, they built an amazing telecommunications network system. They built a dignified standard of living for its people. If you're a middle-class Thai person today, granted COVID and things have, have, have diminished things, but if you're a middle-class Thai person today, you got a nice home over your head, you got a, you got a car in your garage, you can take two holidays a year. None of this happened under democracy. And I'm telling you from my own personal experience, when we were living in the democracies in Asia, our lives were very dysfunctional. When eventually we started living in the non-democracies in Asia, we saw uh, our family saw our incomes rise, our, our access to good health care rise, our access to good education rise. My opportunities increased tenfold, you know, living in Singapore, a globally connected society that's not a democracy. You know, I'm sitting in front of you here today, educated, able to talk about these things, not because I grew up in democracies, but because I grew up in people who set one course of development and didn't allow any kind of democratic election, change of power. They had a course, a national development council. All of these countries had national, they might've been called different things, mm -hmm. but they had a national development council. We are dirt poor. You have to remember East Asia was dirt poor, you know, uh, mm -hmm. on the 1940s and 50s, especially upon independence. And you also have to remember the body count of America is highest in this part of the world, the most That's bomb right. region of the world. And today it is the center of the global economy. It is where the world wants to move. It is looking at East Asia with envy at how they handled. And you might even notice, I haven't even mentioned China because yeah. I know when I mention China, <laughs> when I mention when I mention China, everyone's like, oh, your argument Forget goes it. out the window. Forget I, it. I can make my entire... I can make yeah. my entire argument without even mentioning China, but we can talk about China developing yeah. at a rapid rate. They have their own indigenous system of government, whatever you might think of it, it them in their context, in their history, in their circumstance, in their culture. And it draws greatly from their older practices as well. And yeah. all of these countries that developed in East Asia developed through an indigenous system. The monarchy military kind of power elite sharing thing that going on in Thailand that is a system that's been around for a long time that was never interfered with because they never were colonized, right? So whatever you take morality out the window, oh, I don't dis I disagree with monarchies and militaries and I, I don't care about any of that. All and, I but care the people about who say that don't system? believe that either. I mean, the people who say that are all yeah, I mean, some kind of apologists for Israeli apartheid, Saudi monarchy. Like you, you <laughs> never hear them talk about those things, right? It's always like, it's always the U.S. of enemies that are strongmen and authoritarian. So you, I don't even believe it. Um, but like, if you if you believe the sincerity of the critics of authoritarianism, um, you know, and it's that it's not coming from a anti-China place, which it usually does. Like, you know, I, I when someone approaches me and says, you know what do you think of authoritarianism i start the clock you know <laughs> i'm like china's gonna come up yeah. within, within the next three minutes um, I, I, uh, yeah. I, yeah i yeah i i i think also people forget that when i'm mentioning all these things you know they i, I heard someone tweet me and say i would rather be poor in a democracy than be a slave to a dictatorship and i just why thought, <laughs> no you wouldn't yeah you know, because, <laughs> Because I also I, I also think about this. See, people believe that when I'm saying these things, oh, they developed under military rule, they developed under uh, party mm -hmm. rule, they developed under a monarchy or a dictator or whatever. They believe that these societies are, you know, these dystopian like uh, mm -hmm. novel nightmares that 
And I just wonder where on earth did you get that idea? Do you think yeah. that public debate isn't robust in China? You just don't think so because you don't speak the languages and you don't yeah. go on their, you know, yeah. closed off internet to be able to sing. You don't think, I mean, you're talking to you today in Thailand. I'm sitting here. I, I went to schools here. I had robust debates in school. I had robust public debates. I never felt once that my freedom was limited in any way. In fact, yeah. what is freedom? Freedom is the access to opportunities and healthcare that allow you to, that give you the disposable time and income to be able to come up with all these grandiose ideas that you come up with in the mm -hmm. West, mm -hmm. right? So the idea that, okay, maybe there is limits on certain things, but I can guarantee you most people will take that trade off every day until they reach a certain standard development where then it's okay. Now let's talk, Especially now let's talk, but until you get there, Especially yeah. because, okay, so the time factor is so important, right? Because it's like, there's the time factor yeah. in terms of like the disposable time, like you said, like in la at below a certain level of development, which is characteristic of a lot of democracies, sadly, um, you know, you can't, you don't have the time to engage in cultural, you know, or, or political activity. Um, but, but then there's the, there's another kind of time, which is like, uh, part of the reason the elections that are imposed are so frequent is because uh, development takes time. It takes investment and it, and the state has to be the one to do it. It's, you know, the Westerners worship private models and private investment, but a lot of infrastructure loses money, is not going to make money for a long time and needs a state to do it. And again, having frequent elections means you can make a 10 year, you need a 10 year plan to do something, certain things like build uh, roads or um, electricity grids or solar build out, you know, climate, you know, climate friendly, whatever infrastructure, you need time to do that. And any election that brings a fat, some US fascist into power is going to see that whole thing overthrown. Yeah, I think people also forget that there's no country in the world that developed without state-led development yeah. plans. No, they, that includes that, the Western countries. That's another illusion. People, the Western have. countries, yeah, they are they all Asia knew this. Asia had no 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 yeah. illusions about this. They said we need a state-led development plan. How do you think the West developed? The state was driving eco their economies were completely planned. What are you talking? I mean, what are people yeah. talking about? Yeah. They were the most protectionist, tariff heavy, most yeah. unfree markets in the world. And not, I'm not even talking 200 years ago when Europe was destroyed after the Second World War. What yeah. did the United States tell Europe to do? Have high tariffs, have very high tariffs on imports so that their uh, their industries could develop. Was that it called the Marshall? Economy, my friend. Was it called the Marshall <laughs> Free Market, or what? Was there another word they used? Marshall. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, Marshall Plan. That's exactly. it. Marshall yeah. Plan. Yeah. Plan. Plan. You got to have a plan. So, so I, I think all of these myths that we've been told, I think so many people digest them, and they're so deeply digested that yeah. people think that you're attacking them when you say, "Hey, hang <laughs> yeah, on, yeah. maybe your democracy." Their is identity like, hey, is. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, their identity is invested in these these kinds of mythologies. You know, exactly. and, and you know, th there's one continent I, I want to talk about Africa quite a bit because yeah, 54, please. 55 countries, uh, many many different democratic experiments that have taken place. But and like super we so recent, with Africa, super recent independence, right? Let's remember these were also super recent. colonies until the '60s or '70s for Angola. So the six, yeah. And 90. Namibia got independence <laughs> in the early 90s. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so we're, we're yeah. if we're talking about, I always tell people, you know, uh, the most important development of the 20th century was not what the West says it was, World War II, Cold War. It was the independence of Africa and Asia, 80% of the world. Colonization, 80% yeah. of the world in Africa and Asia, 80% of the world resides in Africa and Asia, and they're going to determine the future. Uh, and that's not just me saying it. Every U.S. intelligence report of said for the 2030s, <laughs> Africa and Asia are in charge of the global economy. But, you know, Africa is a really fascinating uh, thing because they overthrew complete despotic governments, European mm -hmm. governments, European regimes, whatever you yes. want, to, authoritarian, despotic, whatever. Mm -hmm. They overthrew all of these guys. And then what you had in place is you didn't really have democratically elector, elected leaders right in the post-independence era. What you either had was the party or the group that won independence taking power, exactly. or what you had was um, 
uh, another party in power and then maybe the military would overthrow it because they said you guys are still too aligned to the colonial forces and you're not developing the country. Yeah. Right. So I, I look at somewhere like Somalia, where I've done a lot of work, where we got our, you know, uh, mm. our most successful records from. We've done work with new Somali music, but we introduced the world by releasing older Somali music that was pr produced during the 60s and 70s, which was considered the cultural, quote unquote, golden era, their heyday of music. And, you know, you find that when you start looking at Africa during this era, right after independence, when the, the victorious independence party came to power or someone overthrew a party aligned with the colonizers came to power, you find that Africa had actually one of its greatest development spurts in history. You find that incomes increased and you find that what they were doing, like in the case of Somalia, for example, now Somalia had Siad Barre in power. I'm not gonna defend this guy. This guy took the country down with him, a complete mm -hmm. neurotic strongman. But nevertheless, he wasn't the only one in charge. Mm -hmm. There was, a again, a council of people mm -hmm. who said, we have to develop Somalia on our own in terms, our own context to completely decolonize the society. Mm -hmm. And so what did they do? They built a formidable ministry of education that had a huge cultural arm. And that arm educated and trained some of the best musicians that we in Africa of that generation, uh, whose music that we release today is still loved. You know, they created mm -hmm. bands, they created musicians to make Somali music. You know, they mm -hmm. broke down the Italian governor's palace to build a hotel that looked very Somali <laughs> in architecture. That, that Ministry of Education had a, had a literacy program that was one of the world's best. It took something like just a couple of years to get Somali literacy from 6% to something like 50, 60%. And, you know, and, and, they, and, they, and they created a band and went all over the country to celebrate that success. And some of that music is amazing. So, and, and you see this play out, if you just look at the economic data of Africa, immediately in the 60s, 70s, 80s, before the debt crisis of the 80s, you look at the economic data and you see the kind of development that was taking place. And I, I view it through the lens of cultural development, because if your culture is thriving, that means you have a lot of public policies in place that is allowing it to thrive. You have healthcare in place that's allowing your children to be immunized and grow up to be great musicians. You yeah. have an education system in place that is subsidizing and, and training kids in academies. Um, you have a whole lot of things that are going on, right? You can tell a lot by how developed a right. cultural space is in a country by, uh, yeah, you can tell a lot about a country by its cultural space. So in mm -hmm. Abad was, extreme amounts of development taking place at a, in a, in, right after independence, a huge, one, one, you know, you look at the, the photos from this era in Africa. I mean, an era of just unbelievable prowess, potential and hope. And then just a decade later, it's National Geographic vultures eating kids, right? Yeah. Complete one, one, 180 shift in, in, in the, of course it has to do with the imagery as well, but Africa did have very, very strong precipitous decline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what you had was the emergence of a whole lot of democracies in Africa. And we, we, mm -hmm. we, we praise this all the time. Oh, look, Africa, you know, we, we look at those maps yeah, and say, look, in the 60s. Multi-partyism, yeah. Right. We look at those maps and we see Africa in the 60s or 70s and you have all these red squares and say, these were all dictatorships. And then you have it now and you see all these green squares and it says, oh, they're now democracies. Okay, let's compare yeah. and contrast Let's look at Malawi. This, there was an article written in, in The Guardian, which I found absolutely hilarious about Malawi. Because yeah. the article started off by this guy saying, Malawi has everything. It has free and fair elections, peaceful transitions of power. You know, parties get rotated in and out from the elections, but it still remains not one of the poorest countries in Africa, one of the poorest countries in the world. We don't get it. And we then they said, you know, and, the, and you know, the problem is they said, the problem is every time there's elections, the same elites or people tied to those elites keep coming back into power. And I thought, you just described what democracy has meant. What have we been talking about? It was designed it's... for a small elite class to continuously reproduce itself. In the Guardian. <laughs> it's doing it in the, in the Guardian, right? Like the Guardian. Yeah, in the Guardian. Here's, here's a good one to do. Look up, look up uh, where the Guardian journalists went to school. Because it's like, there's like 100 of them and 98 of them went to Oxford or something. <laughs> 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 it's like some it's like some kind of like utterly ridiculous uh ratio another democracy yeah. yeah so yeah, i mean exactly. I, again again we're, again now people again can listen to this and i know people's initial instinct to say these guys are defending autocracy dictatorship unelected rule no i am taking the morality out of this and simply looking at the track record and saying guess what if we discount the Western world, which we should, because it has no bearing or development model for anybody, because like you said, we can never replicate it, what yeah. they did. So if we're looking at Latin America, Africa, and Asia, 
democracy has yielded nothing of value. Yeah. It has not yielded, yielded an iota of prosperity. It has not yeah. e yielded an iota of real development. And the countries that realized this abandoned democratic processes and, and, and forged a consistent path that would not be interrupted are doing very well today. And the countries that tried to do this in Africa, for example, and then were completely disrupted by debt crises, coups, yeah. invasions, you name it, those countries are faltering today. Yeah. And the greatest example, stable, beautiful democracy. Why is it still poor? If people want to be democratic and poor, that's their own volition. I yeah. can imagine most people don't. No. So and, and you know, nobody, yeah. no, they don't get to vote on that. <laughs> um, so here's, let me just say, you, you, you've said you take morality out of it, but I don't, I don't want to take morality out of it because I don't actually think this kind of democracy is all that moral. I don't think it, no, you know, no, we're, yeah, we've been no. talking solely it's on been, the development yeah. criteria, but like on the moral criteria, it also isn't a shining example in any way. Um, you know, in, in, when the U S doesn't like the results that come out of a democracy, they're free to overthrow them, um, you know, from like Lumumba and the DRC, uh, you know, it's too many to name, like we could do the sweep of the global south, but like, you know, read Bill Bloom's Killing Hope or one of yeah. those books that just is a, Bloom's Killing Hope is like a list of all the overthrows of democracy that they've done. Um, Right. If they don't, they, they if they worry that they could lose an election, they don't have them. So like, you know, they're not going to let Palestinians vote in Israel, um, you know, on they're not going to have a power sharing. They, they did. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. When Hamas I mean, they, won. I mean, they, yeah. they, they, they did. Yeah. 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 They when bombed Hamas won, them. they I mean, were like, yeah, we you know, that's we don't recognize that. So there's a there's just a lot of like the whole democracy they worship. They don't really worship. They don't care about. Um, it's it's good as a tool to keep countries from uh, developing because you know this is the thing right like the I I've I've very reluctantly came to this conclusion because I actually uh, you know I'm very sympathetic to like the idea of democracy and to anarchism the idea that like people just you know should have like the maximum freedom but like I've come to realize studying history that leaders are actually really important. And leadership is actually yeah. really important. <laughs> and if it wasn't important, important, then the US and the UK wouldn't go to such great lengths to assassinate every good leader that they that comes up in the global south. And they do. And then, mm -hmm. you know, if assassination, it's like it's like the emphasis on assassination by Israel, US, UK, etc., that kind of clued me in that you can't actually just blow off the idea of leadership in the global south and the uh, the fact yeah. that leaders are important and, and so, i think a lot of countries looked at uh, uh, yeah so you know the yeah. the east india company or the parliaments of of the uk these are cliques of ruling families and like this whole clique of ruling families that all go to oxford or harvard or whatever skull and bone societies etc they they believe that is more powerful than any one leader or tyrant. Like that's their Republican thinking uh, that that they package and call democracy. But you know the authoritarian strongman whatever is what they always talk like call and smear the leader in the third world uh, that is threatening to develop an independent. Uh, economy and and, mm -hmm. and system and so or just threatening to give people health care for god's just sake, threatening you know? to I give mean, people health care or raise well, the minimum wage, like aristide some like pacifistic priest uh, you know who wants to raise the minimum wage in a sweatshop and give like people a, one dollar yeah. one meal a day and they overthrow him as an author they call him an authoritarian and overthrow and, him and so, i think yeah go ahead just the just to say like you know, they they're gonna ask us now, what do you want instead? What you know, if it's not yeah. democracy, what are you advocating? So let's get let's get into that by way of conclusion. Yeah. So it's it's to me again, I cannot believe we lack the political imagination. I see so many people saying, if not democracy or autocracy, what else is there? And if I criticize democracy, they people immediately dump and say, autocracy, despotism. Why are are, are you like are, are, I think these <laughs> these two things exist? Yeah. Most of the political philosophies we follow were invented in the 19th century. 
Yeah. Most of the political philosophy you follow today were invented in the 19th century. Okay, invented by Europeans or Americans yeah. in the 19th century. If we are talking about new economic systems, everyone's all about down with capitalism. Mm -hmm. Why not down with Western parliamentary democracy? Mm -hmm. Western system, they it's a colonial system. They evolved in the same time. They the evolved same, in the same time. They were and as we, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. as we've proven, they're full of crap and <laughs> they are tools of power to keep countries underdeveloped. Yeah. And, and, you know, countries have looked around the world and, um, you know, better to be closed off so that it, because if we have a democracy and we elect the people we want to, the West will destroy us. So, yes. you know, I always just look and say th this is where the, the, the Chinese example comes in or most of the East Asian model, nor talking about China, but we can. What is to say now, I, I'm not a political theorist. I'm not going to sit here and develop a brand new system of government for you. But what I'm going to no. say is. <laughs> Are you telling me these ancient societies cannot look in their own past and develop indigenous government that take the best of what they have already seen work around the world, what they have not seen work around the world, pick and choose. I mean, the, the, the kind of foresight a developing nation has today to look around the world, the amount of development experiences. If I was a brand new country today coming out of colonization, the amount of development experiences I could look around the world today, I could look at the West, I could look at South America, I could look at Africa, I could look at Asia. And I can pick and choose what I think is the best one. And I can look within our own history and, and, and say, what is going to work for our context, our circumstance, our situation, our you know, condition, our history, our culture, what works for us? And yeah. again, Western democracy, as it, we talk about what it is, is an indigenous system for the West. And it's worked right. brilliantly for them and however they want to set it up. It's worked right. amazingly for them. It's their yeah. system. Yeah. Okay. It has not worked for anybody else. And how dare people say democracy is universal? According to whom? You know, <laughs> I mean, acc yeah. according to whom? Because they mean they, they mean this parliamentary democracy, multi-party thing is the universal dictate and universal want of everybody. Says yeah. who? The and I Chinese mean, they're, they're, are extreme. Yeah. They're Chinese yeah. intellectual. I think his name is Zhang Weiwei. Uh, and there's an interesting yeah. dialogue he has with like Kishore Mabubani from um, Singapore. Yeah, and they have this thing where where Zhang Weiwei says something like, you know, the West, you have, multi, you know, some kind of democracy and we have another kind of democracy. And so he's kind of like appealing to that idea that like you can be democratic in different ways. And, you know, China, Cuba, the, you know, North Korea, they all have they all claim democracy, too. They're just like we have elections in Cuba for candidates uh you know that are all in the party like you know they're in the communist party or whatever but the, yeah. but like you choose who's going to administer this or that program and that has a lot of impact on you if you choose you know you that and that person who's accountable and like democratic accountability right like that's a that's a question is like does does this western system uh generate any kind of accountability you, you were you were you were showing me the the german the germans that are losing their minds right now and they're like we're gonna support ukraine no matter what voters think. over like, our voters that's an amazing thing to say in a democracy isn't it and yet that's like that, so if you that do that foreign minister saying that yeah if you do that you're called a tough leader right like when when tony blair like yeah. went to iraq and just killed a million people in iraq despite it being super unpopular in the uk they call the media said he's a tough strong leader you know because he's willing to go against what voters want and then if you you know if you do what if you don't do what corporations want you're an authoritarian strong man uh like maduro yeah or i i, I think I think I think every country should come up with a, a political system. You know, Lee Kuan used to used to always say, he said, I don't care about theories. I care about what works. And whatever works for you, whatever gets you to ten thousand dollars a year, healthcare, education, mm -hmm. roads, telecommunications, good middle class, good standard of living, dignified standard of living. I don't think people have seen enough of the world to understand how tragic some of the living circumstances are in so much of the developing world i mean it's and not the, even funny yeah. it's, and the flip it's, side it's of ridiculous. that is the flip side of that coin is also like how much of an achievement it was for china for example to bring 800 million people out of poverty 
Uh, because they, they used a system that was indigenous without indigenous without system. without committing genocide on a con on a whole continental scale without enslaving another entire you know continent of people they did that and people will be like the oh whole, Xinjiang whatever yeah, yeah I mean they they, they they uh the thing is I always tell people that you know uh the real talk about all of this without even mentioning China is because the it's it's not the Chinese model, it's the East Asian model. Exactly. What China yeah, in East the other con the countries in East Asia and China did the same thing. China just did it on a much grander scale because they're a bigger country. China actually mm -hmm. China actually copied Singapore. If you go down, walk down Shanghai, you just see a million, you know, uh Singapore's actually in in, in <laughs> Shanghai. Um huh. they, they the East Asian experience was about, you know, and East Asian later leaders learned a lot from the African experience because East Asian leaders looked at what happened in Africa and said, you know, these guys were real freedom fighters, the Lumumbas, uh, the Sankaras, mm -hmm. they really had, they had, let's be real, they had real development models for the country. And if they yeah. were in power, those countries Absolutely. would have developed. But what they saw Absolutely. was, what they saw was the African leaders really irked the West and they got overthrown. And the Asian leaders said to themselves, getting bombed or overthrown is not a good development model. So we got to yeah. placate these guys a little bit, not fully extricate from their global capital, all yeah. of this we can build our own indigenous political system that works for us within our context. That's what them did. A single party rule in Taiwan was their own indigenous system. They did it. Military rule in, 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 in South Korea, building the foundation for everything, they did it. Singapore, one party rule, Thailand, the monarchy, military kind of duopoly, they did it. Vietnam with its own system is doing yeah. Damn good right now, okay. And and again, just look at COVID outcomes. East Asia kicked the world's ass. Like it's not yeah. even a question, you know. I mean, in the end, we we still suffered numbers, but not nothing compared to to, to, Vietnam, to Western systems. So Vietnam was comprehensively destroyed in the seventies. So like super super recently. Comprehensively. Yeah, and they still. I mean, they've built a telecommunication system. If anyone's been to Vietnam, you know their internet is fast as hell and it's cheap as hell. A lot of countries can't do this. And you know what? That takes, you know, development takes a generation or two. I mean, in Asia, it yeah. took a generation, right? It took one generation to reach upper middle income status. And now East Asia is just flying. But that means for that one generation, you cannot deviate course. Yeah. And now people might say, oh, Vic, but now some of those countries are democracies. Yes, because once you have you reach right. a level where, again, you have <laughs> yeah. disposable time and income to go to the cafe and have a cup of coffee and talk about liberal ideas. And, hey, guess what? I want a little more freedoms than what they're offering. Then you see people demanding that. But, yes, I fully support people getting to that stage to say, hey, you know what? Thank you for getting us here. But now we want yeah. some changes. And people think when they go out in the streets in Thailand or anywhere in Asia, they're protesting for democracy. No, they're not protesting so that they can have a, you know, a Westminster parliament system. They're protesting because, yeah, they say, hey, you had to limit a few things for us to get to where we are. But guess mm -hmm. what? Now we're there. You can start reducing it. Look at Thailand. Look at, look, let me give you an example of two places I lived in. Okay, so Singapore, a lot of yeah. restrictions while it was developing. I worked at Reuters Global Desk in Singapore. You think that is some authoritarian dictatorship? Why do they have a global desk at Reuters right. where right. we were processing and publishing news from around the world? You right. think there were restrictions on what we could do? Give me a break. Well, there's okay. really funny things where, where Western journalists are like really upset when like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs gets a little sassy with them. Uh, and, yeah, know, the yeah, Chinese, yeah. The Chinese Minister of Foreign Affairs and they're like authoritarianism. And it's like, if it was authoritarian, if it was that authoritarian, you wouldn't be there to get that snarky no. answer or allowed to ask that question. It's the same with Russia, right? They're like, they're like being super rude to Russian ministers and Russians give a little bit back and they're like, authoritarian, Putin, it's Putin's authoritarianism, you know? And it's like, I think they just define authoritarianism as things that Western, you know, elites don't like. And, and they likewise, define authoritarianism, sorry to cut you up, but they define authoritarianism as anything that limits changes in the global south. Yes. yes. Anything, exactly. anything that li li anything that limits a Western yeah. journalist or any Westerners' privileges in the global south. Oh, yeah. wait, I'm not in front of the line to get a vaccine in Thailand. That's authoritarianism. Right. No, nah, buddy, yeah. you're just you're a foreigner. Like, sorry, <laughs> you know, yeah. the, the Thais are, are <laughs> just wait. I, even I'm at the back of the line. I grew up here and I'm at the back of the line. So just wait, yeah. you know, wait your yeah. turn. Um, so, you, you know, to, to, to me, um, yeah, go ahead. Just the, 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 the Neil, the, there's like the country, it's also the wrong kind of contradiction. And that's like another part of, uh, um, 
a part of this discussion, which is like, they want to, Westerners, imperialists, want the world to be divided into democracies and authoritarianisms. And like, the way I see the world is divided into neo-colonies and countries that are trying to escape that system. And so, you know, mm -hmm. any country that's trying to escape that system has a word that's applied to it, which is authoritarian. And it almost doesn't matter what the actual specifics of their electoral system are. So like Chile, again, you know, Chile before, under Allende was as democratic as could be. And they, they called him all these names and then they killed him. They killed him. They killed his army chief of staff and they imposed a authoritarian dictatorship by any definition. And, uh, you know, and justified it as a, as a development model. See, they're also capable of doing yeah. this. They said, you know, Ch you know what, Chile was poor and, and it's prospering. It wasn't prospering. They handed all their resources over to the West. It's, it, you know, compared to what Allende could have done there. It's, you know, and, and now they actually democratically rejected the uh, the kind of progressive constitution. The constitution. Yeah. They just democratically rejected a progressive constitution. I mean, yeah. uh, my biggest fear is, you know, countries that are de democracies and proud of being so and continuously having elections. I do not see them. You know, uh, Kenya just had elections. Nigeria is due elections. You know, yeah. And I see people very uh, uh, excited about it, you know, rooting for their candidate. And I just, I follow it. And I just think, are any of these guys going to take you to yeah. an upper middle income, high income economy in the next 20 to 30 years? No. Or are, are, are we going to come to 2050 and countries in the Sahel, like Chad and Niger, which rank lowest on the human development index, countries like Laos, countries, you know, there, there is yeah. a crop of the world that is still deeply underdeveloped. Yeah. Are, we'll get them there. I don't care what system it is. If it works to get them to a dignified standard of living, remember most of humanity is still mired in these conditions. And if you actually care about the vast majority of humanity, which I think the biggest democratic people, you know, don't because they cannot no. fathom that there are actually billions of people outside of the Western world. No. What system is going to get you there? Build your own, whatever gets you there, whatever works for goodness sake. If democracy works for you, you keep electing people who are developing you, by all means, go ahead. I, I wish you the best. But mm -hmm. the track record speaks very, very poorly of democracy's ability to take a country, develop post-colonial, uh, divided, fragile society to strong, uh, confident, rich, de uh, developed, manufacturing center democracy. I mean, it just hasn't happened. And until yeah. someone wants to come along in a way to adjust this Western democracy system that we have to make it work, I am very, I advocate for countries to do whatever they have to do to get there. And listen, if some state abuses take place, which they're gonna take place, God knows we dealt with shit growing up. God mm -hmm. knows we, I had a, we lived through the Asian financial crisis where our money became peanuts overnight. I mean, I remember mm -hmm. all of this, mm -hmm. you know, God, you know, there's gonna be a lot of challenges, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, but if you have a safe, secure, prosperous, confident society at the end of whatever it is you get, and, and I can almost assure you, anyone who is actually interested in developing your country that way, yeah. act the best interest of your country at heart. I'm going to build rural clinics. I'm going to build a good yeah. education system. I'm going to build telecommunications. I'm gonna... Listen, they are not in the business of mass murdering or disappearing or genociding a bunch of people. Right. Okay, they're just not in that business. They're going to do some bad shit, no doubt. They've all done some bad shit. But you have to <laughs> no, ask but most yourself. Of those, most of those really... genocidal, you know, regimes uh, are, are installed. <laughs> are installed by the West. Yeah, like it just, uh, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, not, yeah. It's, it's, it's very hard to both sides this. Most of the time when you have these big bloodbaths, no. it's because the West had to overthrow some powerful communist party like Indonesia's or or you know, the Independence Party and the DRC, and then they commit a series of genocides to make sure they never get, get back to power. So, you know, they want you- Very, they, very rarely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they want to invoke that sorry, kind of say, imagery. Very rarely. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yes. I was just gonna say, very rarely do kleptocrats in, in the in the way we've seen them, you know, uh, like the Mobutus, the really hardcore kleptocrats who really just plunder their country, almost, I can't think of a single instance actually where they actually emerged from yeah. 
you know, a group of people who wanted to lead the country, they're almost always installed or backed yeah. by France or the United States. Yeah. People, most people in countries don't want to see their country fail, for God's sakes. Most people right. don't. Most people are vested. They're a military, even if they're a strong, they're a single party. They're vested in the they're in the in the development of their country. Yeah. You know, how can yeah. how can you not be? You got to be a mm -hmm. serious sicko to not want yeah. your country to develop or be less poor, you know? So and those people, those people can only be reliably installed in power by Western Western imperial power. They can't be or, or, right. or, or, or corporate interests or anyone yeah. that has an interest in seeing that country remain poor so that your resources are cheap, your clothes stay yeah. cheap, your phones stay cheap, whatever it is, there is an interest in keeping that country underdeveloped. Since we're talking about development and democracy, people should really ask themselves, what will happen if by 2100, mm. all the peoples of Africa, Asia, South America, and the Caribbean are enjoying high incomes, good standards of living, do you think that's going to bode well for Europe and the United States? The, the economy is built. Their standards of living are built. Are literally, you're seeing it in Europe today. They are yeah. built on the resources, cheap resources coming from everywhere else. And those yeah. people have to be kept poor. So those resources are poor. Yeah. And you're seeing it today when they have to give up resources from one country, Russia. Yeah. Their economies are dying a slow yeah. death. Imagine yeah. tomorrow if countries in Africa could do what Russia did and say, we're not going to yeah. export you uranium, copper, cobalt, any of this stuff anymore. And this is happening. This is going to happen. It's going to happen because of China. And that's why the West is so freaked <laughs> out because, you know, Russia waited a little while before they could make sure that their, their mark, they would have a market in China. They would have everything that they needed. Their bases were covered. And then they could do this and Africa will do it too. That's a, a lot of countries are taking strength from this. And I think yeah. a lot of countries are also now questioning the democratic yeah. process because, you know, uh, you know, for 30 years after the end of the Soviet union, we, we, all of these arguments that people are making are really 30 year old arguments. Exactly. You know, I mean, if you yeah, look 70s. back at the, if you look at, yeah, if you, yeah, if you look at the literature of, you know, colonial uh, colonized writers living in the colonies talking about the Western system, they would say yeah. things like your liberalism is all you. They, yeah. they, they knew they saw through all of this stuff. They saw mm -hmm. through this dem democratic, you know, scam. They saw through everything. So mm -hmm. really in the last 30 years, the West has pushed on the entire world and particularly the global South that this is the only system. And they put it yeah. through in their education systems. They put it through in higher education learning. And then the Chinese model have come up and there's a lot of opposition to it. They call it the Chinese model. Again, I call it the East Asian model. This <laughs> yeah. model offers countries a path. You know, so now we have different models around the world. We have different kingdoms. We have the Western kingdom, which is an imperial kingdom, which <laughs> plundered the world to get yeah. rich and develop. We, yeah. have the, the, we have the Gulf model, which is about um, you know, using your resources in a right way, but under an iron-fisted monarchical rule, which yeah. you know, most people, uh, most citizens i know i wouldn't defend the gulf model at all because it, it treats a lot of people horribly but the yeah. citizens of those countries the emiratis the saudis the kuwaitis they live pretty good lives right <laughs> so that that's that model but you can't do it without resources and yeah. then you have the east asian model which lifted yeah. billions out of poverty most bomb mm -hmm. region so now again democracy well, my goodness man well, <laughs> there's there's models coming up every day <laughs> what we what we well, don't have say in 20 years yeah. yeah we don't have a south asian model and that's <laughs> Probably because of democracy. <laughs> you know, democracy, I think I think a lot more Indians are coming around to the fact. I see this on Twitter. I don't know how big of a pool this represents, but a lot more Indians, Pakistanis are coming around to the fact that, hey, guess what? Democracy hasn't really developed, delivered much to us in a very long time. Yeah. You know, uh, there's no reason India should be lagging behind its East Asian neighbors. There's just no reason yeah. um, besides the fact that India has pursued oh, yeah. a path of and the, constant and the, change. The whole fr like uh like the British, uh, you know, I don't want to I don't want to talk forever. We'll we'll have more episodes, but like the the British had this yeah. thing where they fragmented South Asia into as many little identities as possible, so that they could um, say the only the only arbiter of what India is is the British. You need an external fair arbiter. And the, the Indian and Pakistani, I guess, states just took that on, right? They were just sort of like, yeah, the state is the arbiter and, you know, as many little caste and 
class and religious divisions, uh, you know, and vote vote that way. And democracy just again encourages that. But like, yeah, yeah. So you know, we're at a we're at a very interesting part of uh, in in history where we can we can. I hope countries have the political imagination and the people to again. There are new models emerging every day, and yeah. up your own model. Who don't says you have worship, to you, again? Don't worship, don't worship the people that. who who colonized you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for goodness' sakes! I mean, and and just from the first premise we made, this was yeah. a system invented by some of the most horrible human beings of the yeah. earth. How do, how on earth do you trust it? And they has yeah, it and they've, for you? they if it they hasn't, think they have they can, they've showed up and said, "I have a great idea for you." <laughs> Run, <laughs> run, run away, run away from that. Run, run away. All right. Yeah. So Thank develop you, your own indigenous systems, your own ma. Thank you. Thank you, Justin.